Hello and welcome to News Click. My name is Vijay Prashad. Today, with great pleasure, we have with us Roger Waters. Roger Waters is a revolutionary musician uh, in two senses. On the first sense, he's a person who revolutionized music. Um, most people of my generation would not have had an adolescence without his songs, without Pink Floyd. But as well, He's a revolutionary who happens to be a musician. Um, you know, in his career as a human being, he's taken up all the major issues of our time, including the cause of the Palestinian people. And I think importantly as well, taken up causes in South America, uh, especially in this period when imperialism has been striking back um, to make gains against people's movements. Roger, great to have you with us. It's really good to be here, BJ. Good to see you, brother. Nice to see you. Um, why don't we start with where we are? I mean, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, you're in the United States at present. Give us a sense of what you think of the governments of, let's say, <laughs> Boris Johnson in Great Britain, Donald Trump in the United States, and how they've handled the pandemic and how these societies are coping with it. <laughs> well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, Bojo is somewhat surprising in that uh, his response is not pure Thatcherism, or it doesn't seem to be. So it may be that... Uh, you, you have to understand, when I answer these questions, though, I never watch television, and I don't read the papers. So somehow, so information only trickles down through me, through through a wall of resistance on my part not to buy the propaganda, not to listen to it, not to take any notice of it. But obviously, um, some of it gets through. Um, in fact, uh, this morning, uh, I got up and I had my first cup of coffee. And, and the first thing that I did was read Corona Shock, your piece about China, which I'd read before because... Now you, ha now you have that story going out as a booklet with those beautiful paintings um, illustrating it all. But, but it's, all very, it's, it's such an important article um, because people have to be told that, you know, that um, COVID-19 is not some Chinese plot to destroy the Western civilization, which is the story that... Um, Mike Pence and you know and Pompeo and 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 the Donald himself clearly and probably Boris Johnson as well would have us believe because that's the way their minds work and um, it's all part of that exercise of control. Um, it I was in New York when this all started happening. I've sort of um, done a runner, so I'm now 100 miles almost from New York in the countryside somewhere in isolation. So. Um, you know, like everybody else, I'm sort of waiting to see what's going to happen and, and whether all, all the panicking about, oh, the world economy is going to collapse and it'll be, you know, billions of people are going to die of starvation because we isolated or what, whatever, the, whatever the current fad story may be. Um, thank goodness we have electron microscopes and we have... Um, you know, competent medical authorities who are doing the research and who, uh, and uh, who are trying to figure out what to do. I, I had an interesting um, email exchange with a friend of mine the other day. He's, he's called him, his name's Greg Galeazzi, and he's a lovely young man. Um, he, he had both his legs blown off in, in Afghanistan a few years ago. And what did he do when he got back? And he, I met him in Walter Reed, where I was working with some of them making music. And um, what did he decide to do, our Greg? He decided that he was going to uh, apply to medical school. He's now in his fourth, he's just starting his fourth year at Harvard Medical School. Can you imagine? I mean, the, the courage that it's taken to do that. So it was fascinating. And he was talking, he said that, because they're now in isolation techniques and things, they're, they're having to do bits of the curriculum that they're fitting in from other places. Ethics. And I went, wow, I, we need to talk about this a bit. 
And, um, and, and I haven't had that conversation with him, but in order to have a health service that is basically um, profit motivated is, is a contradiction in terms. It's oxymoronic. No, if you have a health service, it has to be about providing health care for the people. Uh, and of course, in the United States, they don't have one. They have to have a health service for rich people, and that's it. And so it's, it's, very, it's a strange and alien um, atmosphere for an Englishman who grew up with the National Health Service, uh, you know, in England. And so I live, I, you know, I literally started my life, you know, with Beecham and, and, and in that post-war dream where, where the health service was created in, in post-war England. And of course, it's all crumbled to some large extent. I don't know if you've seen John Pilger's uh, documentary. I think it's called The Dirty War Against the National Health Service. So, you know, we see the, the same story is unfolding all over the world in different ways. And if, if, you don't watch, if you don't watch television, if you live in the United States and you don't read the New York Times or the Washington Post or any other of those instruments of propaganda, you do get a picture that filters down. So, and it's really interesting the way the more socialized societies are resisting um, the empire and are kicking back. So, so you see it in, you know, obviously in South America, in Venezuela and Bolivia and Mexico now. And you, you see this struggle going on between the pure, purest evil of Bolsonaro and, you know, whatever his name is, Marquez in Colombia and, 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 and all, all, all of that. And, you know, the Bolivarian Revolution. It doesn't matter whether it's Bolivar or, or Che Guevara or whoever it is, but all, for, for the last couple of hundred years, people have been trying to figure out how to wrest power from the monarchs and allow it to devolve to the people. You so, know, yeah, Roger, last year uh, there were massive demonstrations in Chile, in Ecuador, uh, Ecuador, of course, which you know very well, you've been to uh, the areas where Chevron had its big oil spill. There were massive protests in, in it's Bolivia. It's not a spill. Don't, you check, don't call it a spill. It's not a spill. It was the deliberate. Exactly. Dump. It's not a spill. You're quite right. The oil, let's say the, the release of oil into people's, into people's yeah. communities and so on. Um, those protests were quite significant, but obviously they were shut down, you know, because of this great lockdown. On March 31st, you released your cover of Victor Hara's uh, really brilliant song, uh, El Derecho de Vivir en Paz. Uh, why did you release that song on March 31st in the middle of the lockdown with beautiful images of the protests from Chile? Uh, why? Because... Uh... I have a strong um, affinity with uh, Santiago in particular because that's where I've worked when I've been in Chile. But also, I got involved with, uh, when they had the big earthquake and the tsunami, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, whenever it was, a little bit, with an organization called um, Un Techo Para Chile, A Roof Over Chile. And... Uh, and I make fr I make friends, you know, where, where I go and I stay in touch with people. So that video was put together by a friend of mine, um, Pablo Lopez. His name. He's a doctor. He's a working doctor, so he's he's pretty busy at the moment in Santiago, working in ICU. Um, and his he put together that the video. So he made he made the video that goes with my rendition. However, I had made it my business to go and have a glass of wine with John, who is um, Victor Hara's widow. And so I met her and I met Amanda, his, their daughter. And a few years ago, when I, was, when I was doing gigs there, and actually we played um, El Derecho. I had it on my phone. And, and, and in the National Stadium, um, 
I held it up to a microphone and and everybody started singing along with it because it was him, you know, uh, singing the song. And of course, he is a great national hero. So, so that kind of indomitable spirit and resistance to the Pinochets and now Piñera, who's the current, um, well, he's the El Presidente, but he's, you know, he, he's cut from very much the same cloth as Pinochet. Um, is heroic and um, and we and well obviously we'll never forget them and and in Santiago and in a lot of other places in in uh, in South America as well the Casarolazo, which is the you know the the protest with the banging of pots and pans in the street or even just after curfew leaning out of the window and banging is deeply moving. And they are. I mean, I wrote some new lyrics to put, and that's the other thing: is it stems from anger as well. They are, they are, they are shooting children's eyes. They're trying specifically to blind them. They shoot them with balls, plastic balls from shotguns, so like that that size, and they aim at their eyes, and and they're quite good shots, and they've blinded thousands of kids. And it's disgusting. It's so disgusting. Um, anyway, I don't want to rant on. No, no. It's, you know, this shooting into the eyes is a commonplace thing of these kind of governments. During the uprising in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, uh, government snipers were shooting into the eyes of children. We see this in Kashmir, where the Indian troops are shooting uh, into people's faces and things. It's, it's repulsive, truly yeah. repulsive. But what I found most powerful about your rendition of the song was that it's a reminder that even in the lockdown, those demonstrations haven't really ended. No, they haven't. And I, I spoke to Pablo just last week and I said, what's going to happen? He said, well, it's all quietened down. But he said, nothing has gone away. The second that this, the, the pandemic lifts a bit, all those children and grown-ups as well, will be out on the streets. This is not going away. The people have got the bit between their teeth, certainly in Santiago. And, and, and when, that, when seeing what recently happened in Bolivia, where they got rid of uh, Evo Morales, and, and you know he's had to flee his country, which he had... Talk about pulling a country up by its bootstraps. That man single-handedly turned Bolivia you know, from a, from, from a feudal state in, into, into, some, into, a, into a proper modern progressive country where they were beginning to distribute the wealth of a lot more. And where they, where they um, paid, uh, were st starting to take the indigenous population, of, which is the huge majority of the population, including Morales, you know, and so it was, so it was a so Bolivia was a wonderful example of, and you know, but they they made one huge mistake in Bolivia, they found lithium, and then they were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the most refreshing things about the way you see things, and I wish more people did, is that you basically have a, a moral you know, perspective, like this is disgusting what is happening here, you know, and you say it right in that way. Yeah. Um, the other area where you've taken an a important stand, you know, at great cost, I think, because this cost is asked of everybody who takes that stand, is the other disgusting open saw on the planet, and that's the occupation of the Palestinians. Could you just tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the struggle with the Palestinians and what it means. Yeah, I, w I was sort of blind, like almost everybody, you know, um, after the Second World War. And I was, when, when the war finished, I was two years old. So I wasn't really copying very much of what was going on. But, the, it, it, you know, the, and then in 1948, I still wasn't copying anything. So the Nakba meant nothing to me living in England as a, you know, a five-year-old kid or whatever. And there, were, and there was a lot of propaganda about, about, you know, this glorious new state for the Jewish people and Israel and blah, blah, blah. And, and also it was very, um, 
um, I come from a very left wing background in England. And so the, there was a lot of lauding it because, because it was the whole thing about the kibbutzes and it was very socialist in its own way, or at least it was pretending to be at the time. <clears throat> so anyway, blah, 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 and then blah, 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 and I went to school and then I went to college and studied architecture. And then I, you know, and then I got involved in a pop group and boom. And, and so, and, uh, I've been doing that professionally since 1967. Well, 33 years later, or it's the turn of the whatever, and and I'd started doing some shows again. And I was doing a tour of Europe, and somebody said, "Well, we'll go, go, you can do a gig in in uh, Tel Aviv." Okay. Um, and I and I got I started getting emails. And very, very, very quickly, I found myself in correspondence with the right guy who was Omar Baguti, who's since become a very close friend of mine, uh, you know, who was one of the founders. But it was right then, this is in 2005 or 2006, that's it's just when the BDS movement started um, as an expression of the will of the whole of Palestinian civil society. And... Um, so he asked me to um, uh, not go, join, join the boycott. And um, for better or for worse, I cancelled the gig, which was in the stadium in Tel Aviv. But I did go and play. But, and we played at a village called Neve Shalom, or Wahat Asalam is the Arab name for it, which is a peace village. It's ecumenical and and uh, Druze and Christians and Jews and uh, Muslims all live together and their children all go to school together. And they grow chickpeas. It's an agricultural community. So we did a gig there. And it was the biggest gig there's ever been in Israel by a long way. I did, it was during my Dark Side of the Moon tour. And um, we had 60,000 people there. And we started, we didn't start till midnight because nobody could get there. The roads were packed and blah. And it was, but... I went back a year later and, um, and I was taken under the wing of UNRWA <clears throat> and a lovely woman called, what was her name, Pacheo. Um, I've forgotten her first name. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And um, so the UN sort of took me all, all, all over the occupied territory. I didn't go to Gaza, but I went everywhere else. And I, and I, I was like that. Ah. Are you? This was in two thousand and six or seven, and and by then it was like, I thought, how can I have been this blind? It is so horrific to watch what's going on, and you're driving down this empty, you know, highway, and um, Alexia was that her name? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Explaining, well, you know, of course, if you're Palestinian, you can't use this road. They go through the little tunnels and everything's blocked off. And but because these, these are for only for settlers, these are for only Jewish people who are allowed to drive on these roads. Because actually, it was illegal for Israeli citizens to go into the occupied territories. So, so and it was just, and, the, and I, I had long conversations with the elders in the refugee camp in Janine, and they would, and I'd sit there and listen to these. It's these stories, and and so it became quite clear to me that I couldn't rest <clears throat> until, um, you know, there was some measure of uh, equality in terms of human rights in that part of the Middle East because it's disgusting and it's got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and so now it is completely awful apartheid fascist state white supremacist colonial settling of uh, indigenous people and attempting to destroy them man by m m one at a time or maybe many at a time you know it's slow genocide is, is what the israeli government is perpetrating there so that's why um my politics now have come down to this tiny platform um, which is this platform. It's Paris 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I believe in it. So if I'm having a conversation with somebody from the Israeli lobby, I will say to them, do you believe in it? I would say this to Donald Trump or Mike Pompeo or Mike Pence, or do you believe in it? And if they're honest, they go, no, 
absolutely, are you insane? Of course we don't believe in human rights. Well, I do. I think it's fundamentally important. And the only way for this globe to survive is for us to respect the thinking that's gone on since the Enlightenment over the last two, three hundred years. And to accept that there, that there is a route forward, but it, but it can only, we can only move forward and save this fragile planet that we call home um, if we cooperate with one another rather than fighting one another. It's, it's so self-evidently clear and obvious. We cannot just be driven by, by a profit motive and by a narrow national self-interest and patriotism. The last Amazing. Amazing. Um, what I want to say to people who are listening is that um, the reading assignment that comes with this interview is the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights. And while you're reading that, make sure that you put on Dark Side of the Moon, a great soundtrack to the UN Declaration. Roger Waters, thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's good to see you, brother. Thank <laughs> you.